Okay, uh, moving on to the next talk, I want to invite uh, Dr. Uh, ben Anger to the to the series today. Uh, Dr. Anger is originally from Montana and uh, got his BS degree from the University of Idaho. Uh, and then he went on to complete his MS at Washington State under Dr. Larry Fox um, and kind of got into the mastitis world before he then moved on to Virginia Tech to work with Mike Akers for his PhD and really switched more to lactation physiology and studied how mammary growth is affected by mastitis. So he's kind of at the interface of those worlds. So now Dr. Anger works at the Ohio Agricultural Research and Development Center at Ohio State uh, and has a lab focused on mastitis and mammary physiology. Uh, recently, they've worked on evaluation of mammary blood vessel development, uh, colostrum formation, heifer mastitis abatement tools, and recently got a USDA grant to investigate how mastitis impacts mammary growth and development. So Dr. Anger, thank you so much for participating today. I look forward to your talk. And we got to unmute you here. There we go. All right. Let's get the pointer back. Where'd it go? Well, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the US or other countries visiting or uh, uh, sitting in on today's talk. Um, today, what we'll be talking about is the prevalence or consequences of heifer mastitis really focusing on mammary development. And we're gonna jump around quite a bit, but one of the things I'd like to be extremely clear upon before we begin this talk is I'm talking about heifers. I'm not talking about primiparous cows that people commonly call heifers. We are talking about non-lactating springer heifers or uh, about to be bred heifers, not the lactating animal producing milk. So we're gonna jump around quite a bit the first thing I'd like to start off with today is discussing the prevalence of intramammary infections or mastitis in heifers uh, to establish everyone on the same page of how common are these and is this really something that's prevalent in the industry. Then we'll talk about intramammary infections in lactating glands just to get everyone a background of why mastitis is deleterious to milk production and then transition that into the heifer itself. So specifically, we'll be talking about the mammary growth during first gestation and how that is pivotal and fundamental for setting that animal up for success. And then with all of these different avenues that we've discussed, talk about how these two uh, important competing systems, both mastitis and the immune response to solve that, that infection, as well as mammary growth are going to likely resolve and, and shake out by the time that animal calves in uh, for her first lactation. So heifer uh, mastitis or intramammary infection prevalence has been summarized many times before and I'm not going to do it in detail. If anyone is interested, you can look at any three of these reviews by Sarnay de Vigler, uh, Larry Fox or de Vigler and others in 2012. They do a very nice job summarizing that, but the take home point is approximately 43% of heifer quarters are infected prior to that animal ever going into the lactating herd. So if, if we wanted to just be crude with that, two of four of the quarters of every heifer are gonna be infected, or you could be talking about every, every other, or one of four heifers is gonna have all four quarters infected. So overall, this is a pretty prevalent disease in the dairy industry. Um, and because of its prevalence or widespread prevalence, we should start to consider how this is impacting the, the normal mammary development we'd like to see. The three main pathogen groups that I like to uh, classify these under are the coagulase negative staph species, staph aureus, and the environmental pathogens. There's a couple of different breakdowns for this, but this is what I'm gonna emphasize today. Overall, the coagulase negative staph species, and this can be a multitude of different pathogens that fit into this grouping, are the most common causative agent for intramammary infections in heifers. If we look at the breakdown of those, those previous uh, review articles, we're gonna average approximately 30% of quarters being infected by this group of pathogens in particular. And if we look at the different breakdown of the species, we can have staph chromogenes, epidermidis, hemolyticus, xylosis, simulans, the list goes on and on and on. But these four, and I think there's another one which would be xylosis, 
are the main key players. And really the prevalence of these depends upon the herd characteristics as well as the geographic location. So for example, if we're over here in the United States, simulans is not necessarily as common as it would be over in the European Union. This is a pathogen they see a lot of, whereas we typically don't see it very often. But overall, if we're gonna talk about infections in heifer mammary glands, this is the biggest key player there. Staph aureus is everyone's favorite bug to talk about except mine because I, I typically hear so much about it, I get tired of listening to it. But overall, staph aureus infections are going to also be common in heifers as well. If we look at the overall average, we're gonna be about 4% of heifer quarters being infected, but this is significantly influenced by the management and environmental factors of the herd itself. So for instance, if we're at a dairy farm with a lot of flies, we're going to likely see a higher infection rate of Staph aureus versus if we're at a colder place where the, where the flies can't survive. Um, so overall, the range is hu huge. There's one study from the Netherlands, I believe it was, that saw less than 1% of heifers being infected with Staph aureus or heifer quarters. Whereas if you went down to Louisiana, you're gonna see 15% of heifer quarters being infected with these infections. The significance of this is that Staph aureus is a significant uh, detriment to milk production in mammary gland development, and it is a contagious pathogen. So once these animals freshen and calve into the herd, we are introducing Staph aureus into the lactating herd, which can then spread to other lactating animals. So overall, this is deleterious, but you can see that there's flies on these uh, heifer teats and the scabs that are there. And what this is recognized as doing is spreading Staph aureus from heifer to heifer to heifer. Now, if we look at the environmental pathogens, it's actually larger in terms of an overall percentage um, than Staph aureus. So why am I not talking about it in the same significance of that? And the problem is, is with 7% of quarters being infected with an environmental pathogen, we have a significant grouping of pathogens that fall under as environmental pathogens. So we have the strep species um, as well as the different coliforms that we like to think about. So we have some uh, E. coli there and coliforms. So serratia, Klebsiella, E. coli, Lactococcus, the list goes on and on and on. And so when you start divvying these out to the respective 7% of quarters that are gonna be infected by an in environmental pathogen, really identifying which one of these, if any of them are the big key players, starts to become difficult and is likely also affected by um, geographic and environmental uh, factors. So overall, the main takeaways I'd like to just have everyone recognize from that snapshot is overall heifer intramammary infection prevalence is high and these are often unnoticed. If you, as the consultant, go out and talk to your producer and say, hey, how many of your, your heifers in the back 40 have mastitis? Most of them would say none. And that's, that's the issue. These infections are undetected. No one's uh, crawling under their, their heifers in the back 40 to see if there's infections. And if there are infections, they're likely to be subclinical, not clinical. Coagulase negative staph and staph aureus are the predominant pathogens. Environmental pathogens are still significant, but identifying which one is the most important makes this a difficult challenge. But overall, this is the, this is the issue that's here and that's present. So let's talk about what that means to the mammary gland itself. So let's recap of what happens in a lactating mammary gland when we have the establishment of an intramammary infection. So we have our, our udder here, this is your rear quarter, here's your gland cistern, and then the outside of the teat here, we have our bacteria. And they migrate up through the street canal, make it their way into the cistern, proliferate, and then migrate into the secretory tissues. So up there would be where the alveoli are that are responsible for synthesizing and secreting milk components into the lumen. If we take a cross section of one of these alveolar structures, we can see our circular arrangement of our mammary epithelial cells. And then on the outside of those are your myoepithelial cells here. And then throughout this entire tissue, you're gonna have your blood, your, uh, the, the capillaries that are gonna be there and all the constituents as part of the blood. So your leukocytes and your red blood cells. 
So once we have those bacteria, which are designated here in the lumen of this, this alveolus, we're gonna initiate the production of an inflammatory response by these bacteria producing immunostimulatory factors. This could be LPS or lipotectoic acid, all those general things that are going to irritate mammalian cells and initiate an inflammatory response. So as a result, that's gonna result in the recruitment of neutrophils primarily from the blood migrating through the tissue into the lumen of the alveolus to address this infection. This immune response is not without consequence. As a result, we're going to have tissue disruption. The bacteria itself is gonna be producing cytotoxins which damage these cells. And you're also going to have just simply production of the reactive oxygen species damaging the tissue that surrounds uh, the alveolus as well as the mammary epithelial cells also. So as a result, we're gonna have some death of some mammary epithelial cells and those cells are then going to be removed and we can also have scarring of this. So as a result of all of this, we're reducing the number of cells that are making milk and we're also reducing the productive capacity of those cells when we have a mastitis event. All right, so that's for lactating glands. Let's come back to the heifer non-lactating mammary gland. And the most important thing I'd like everyone to recognize when we talk about heifer mammary glands, and the same thing would even apply for dry cows if we're going to talk about lactating versus non-lactating. Just because the mammary gland is non-lactating does not mean it's doing nothing. In the heifer itself, we are having the growth and development of that mammary gland for the very first time ever, and it's developing that foundational structure, which the next and every other lactation is going to be based upon. So non-lactating does not mean not doing anything. This mammary gland is gonna be growing in size and developing those structures that have yet to be um, established for the synthesis and production of milk. So we're going from almost a non-existent udder to a fully productive udder. How is this accomplished? The mammary gland um, or the dairy uh, cow has an udder made up of four separate mammary glands. In this image, we have rear uh, quarters that have been cut in cross section. Here's your medial suspensory ligament. And then you have two teats that are here um, that are attached to the functional tissue, which I'm referring to as parenchyma here. This is in a breeding age heifer. And what is happening here is this parenchyma is growing and expanding up into what is referred to as the fat pad. That fat pad is eventually replaced throughout pregnancy by this parenchyma, which will then develop into the alveolar structures for the copious production of milk components. To illustrate how marked this uh, uh, change is during that first pregnancy, there's only one study that I'm aware of that actually produces uh, a striking comparison such as this. And so this is an udder from a heifer collected at breeding. And here we have the udder of a heifer that is immediately before calving. And here you can see copious amounts of fat and limited amounts of parenchyma that is still continuing to branch and expand into that fat pad. By the time we have um, the establishment of lactation through uh, parturition, that fat pad has been completely invaded by the parenchyma and replaced. And now we have alveolar structures which were non-existent at this time. So we're having marked amounts of growth as well as development. And by development, I'm talking about the formation of those alveolar structures. Both are important. This growth as indicated by the accumulation of cell numbers is not constant, but exponential. As we go through the different trimesters of gestation, the first, second, and third, we're going to have increasing cell numbers at an exponential rate. So most of that growth is happening during the last trimester. And indeed, I'd ask anyone to go out and start looking at their heifers in the back 40, and you'll see very little change in the first two trimesters, but in that last trimester, the mammary gland starts to parallel the growth of the fetus and takes off. Now, coming back to development, we're still having growth and accumulation of cells that will form the alveolus, and that's coming from the epithelium. That is the epithelial cells that synthesize and secrete milk they are growing and expanding into this fat pad or stroma. And at the same time, 
we are needing to have the stroma compartment regress and the lumen open up to allow um, milk to be accumulated and stored in between each and every milking. So to compare the architectures of these tissues, very pronounced areas of stroma as compared to a lactating gland where we have little amounts of stroma. The epithelium, which is here, is relatively unorganized and just in strands, whereas here it's opened and you have large luminal spaces for the collection and holding the milk, as opposed to this heifer mammary, mammary gland tissue, which has limited luminal space. So why do we care about all of this? The number of cells that are in the mammary gland and how active and productive they are, are the sole determinant of milk production. If we take away an animal's food, when she is milking, we're going to negatively impact milk production. Not likely by reducing the number of cells, but turning off those cells because the metabolic activity of that animal is saying she's in negative energy balance and is essentially having less uh, energy to produce milk. Meanwhile, if we reduce the growth of that mammary gland, we likely are going to negatively impact milk production as well. So what about heifer mammary glands when we start talking about mastitis and inframammary infections? So there's only one report that I'm actually aware of that looks at inframammary infections in heifer mammary glands. And it's an older study from 1990, which apparently today is considered old, but considering this work has not been picked up since, I'd say it's one of the most recent ones, if not the. Um, but what we have here is an in, uh, image of an uninfected mammary gland compared to an image of mammary tissue collected from a uh, Staph aureus infected quarters. And really the comparison that's starting to become evident here is the reduced amount of epithelium in the Staph aureus gland compared to the uninfected or uninhibited quarter. So by epithelium, I'm referring to these tubular structures where you can see that lumen that's starting to poke through there. And we see most of this, this image actually being occupied by uh, epithelial structures. Whereas when we switch over to this, most of this is just filled with stroma. We have a large duct, but very few epithelial structures. We have one up here, another one here, couple here, but it's pretty striking that most of this image is occupied by fat pad or supportive stroma, as opposed to the development of the epithelium, which will ultimately give rise to those epithelial or avular structures. So recently, uh, we, we sought to understand what truly happens when you have mammary growth occurring at a marked degree compared to the previous study where they were only looking at unbred heifers. So those, in, those uh, heifers' mammary glands were un, uh, those, those animals were non-pregnant. So the mammary growth that was occurring was marginal. It was still occurring, but not at the same rate as you would expect during pregnancy. So what we did with uh, this recent experiment was inject copious amounts of estradiol and progesterone daily into dry cows to stimulate rapid mammary growth and development, and then challenge two quarters of each animal with either staph aureus or saline as a negative control to basically make that comparison, what is happening in these infected mammary glands when mammary growth is being stimulated or elicited. And then we collected mammary tissues both five days and 10 days post-challenge. So as a result of pretty much all inframammary infections, when we infuse Staph aureus into these non-lactating mammary glands, you still see an increase in somatic cell count just like in a lactating mammary gland. So in these challenged quarters that were infected with Staph aureus, the somatic cell count went up, whereas in your saline control infused quarters, uh, somatic cell count remained the same. So ultimately the illustration of this is inflammation was demonstrated and an immune response did occur. Then we started to look at the architecture of the mammary tissue and traced out all the different uh, mammary tissue structures, specifically focusing on a lobule and then tracing out uh, luminal space as well as the epithelium to then determine intralobular stromal area, epithelial area, and luminal space. 25,000 circles later, you are left with this one image. And what we see here is that Staph aureus infused quarters, as denoted by the white, 
uh, bar here had less epithelium than saline infused quarters. And the uh, Staph aureus infused quarters also tended to have more stroma than your saline infused glands. So ultimately it would indicate that less epithelium was indeed growing and developing in those mammary tissues. To do a, a thorough evaluation, we sought to understand what cells were actually dying as a result of this infection and what cells were proliferating. So what we stained these mammary tissues for was cleaved caspase three and positive cells would be brown here and looked at different structures, whether it was in the stroma or the epithelium. And then we did a KI-67 staining approach to see which cells were proliferating. And so your, your pink cells that are indicated here are the cells that are proliferating. Overall, when you tally all the numbers up together, you get a couple of complete or just nice succinct sentence, sentences that can result here. So overall, Staph aureus quarters had more epithelial cells that were undergoing apoptosis or controlled cell death than saline glands, but had similar proliferation rates. So what that really is driving home is you're having more cell death without an increase in proliferation, which would then result in less accumulation of cells over time. If we're gonna focus on the stromal compartment, Staph aureus quarters had more cellular proliferation in the stroma, particularly being immune cells and fewer cells undergoing, a, undergoing apoptosis. So what that is really driving home is that stromal compartment that needs to regress and allow for the expansion of the lumen and epithelial uh, compartment is not occurring. So when we're having the opening of this lumen invading that stromal area, this space in those Staph aureus infected glands was not con contracting or regressing at the same rate as normal uninfected mammary glands. So ultimately this is impeding the mammogenesis that we would like to expect. So what does this all mean and where, why do we care? I like saying you never missed what you didn't have and I think that sums up milk production quite nicely with this. So a study in 2003 by Oliver and others at the University of Tennessee infused heifers uh, quarters with an intramammary antibiotic treatment 14 days before they actually calved in. And this resulted in an increase in milk production by 10%. That means that the normal animals that were untreated are gonna have more infections and they calved in at 10% less milk yield. And you never knew you were missing out on that milk production. And this has also been demonstrated by Owens and others in 91, where they treated heifers uh, eight weeks prepartum, and this increased milk production 13%. So I really do think the analogy of you never miss what you didn't have really strikes home here. This is just simply lost milk production that was never ever captured and just simply lost potential of those heifers. And this is really emphasized when we start thinking about how much resources producers invest in their heifers. Um, and then we fall short in preparing them in the last trimester for a successful lactation. Additionally, heifers that freshen with these infections are gonna have a higher somatic cell count and be at a higher call risk for first lactation. So overall conclusions from this are prepartum intramammary infections appear to impair uh, parenchymal expansion and induce the expansion of the stromal compartment. This is gonna result in unrealized milk, milk yield losses. And the big question that continues to uh, make me ponder about things is the, the question of, are these changes permanent? If you disrupt normal mammary growth and development during that first gestation when the mammary gland is being established, does that impair milk production for that first lactation and every subsequent lactation, or is it possible to rescue that animal? And this is something that is still left to be decided or determined. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the funding for some of this research. USDA NIFA has been very kind to us. We actually received some more money to continue this investigation and try to start looking at gravid heifers in particular 
and some of this work was also supported by the Virginia Agricultural Council. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions that anyone may have. Ben, thank you very much. Excellent talk. So I guess, first of all, you presented a couple of slides ago, some previous work where people had used antibiotics pre-calving in heifers and seen 10 to 13% increases in, in milk yield. Is that in heifers with known intramammary infections or was this just a blanket treatment? That was just a blanket treatment. Let's take half the herd, infuse them with um, the antibiotic uh, of choice and leave the other half as untreated controls. And what was observed was a 10% increase in milk yield. All four quarters without ever knowing what the infection status of that was. I think they did actually do cultures, but it was not the objective of assigning treatments. Okay. So that's that seems kind of incredible to me. I mean, that's a big response when you don't even know, you know, that the treated ones have an existing infection. How do you interpret that? I mean, do you think it's that common? I think it's that common. Um, one of the things that I continue to think about the impact of this inflammatory response occurring is does this interfere with the differentiation of the mammary epithelial cells during that pivotal two to three days immediately preceding parturition or even the immediate two or three days after parturition? Does this somehow interfere with turning those cells on? That's, that's a question I've been left with as well. Yep. But I, I think that is really clearly an infection response is really you're treating those infections, doing away with them, and somehow that is really having a marked uh, reduction or impact on milk. Wow. So uh, you maybe already partially answered this, but with what we know today, um, if you have a heifer cabin starts making milk on first test, she's super high somatic cells. She's got an existing intramammary infection. You know, you said, we don't know if this is a forever thing. I mean, are there cases where you put them on the do not breed list right away? Uh, how do you, how do you yeah. approach that with what we know right now? Well, every, every farm is going to be different. If it's a high gener genetic merit animal, obviously that's going to influence your decision-making process. Um, Realistically, that's always a discussion with your herd veterinarian, whether it's to treat or not treat. But one of the considerations is, is how many quarters are infected, how many are inflamed, and what is the responsible pathogen? So for example, I was once asked by a veterinarian, you know, should we be treating coagulase negative staph infections because they typically are going to have minor inflammatory responses? And I said, well, if it's one quarter, probably not. It's probably going to cost you a lot more money to treat that and then dump the milk versus see if that will self cure. But if you have three quarters that are infected with that pathogen, yes, it probably warrants it. Um, and the same thing could be true for how many other pathogens are there. Is it, is it just coagulase negative staph? Or are we talking about like staph aureus or streptococcus uberus or something else that is going to more dramatically impact milk production? So okay. it, it, it is, it depends is the most correct answer I could give. <laughs> it's always the right answer. Yes. Uh, so here's another question, and I don't mean this to challenge you, but it, you know, somebody who's not in this space, this is the difficulty I have with this. So you show some evidence that I wasn't aware of that you know maybe it would be smart to to give an antibiotic regimen to all incoming heifers. How do you align that with the the pressure, I guess, to minimize antibiotic use? Well, I think that's a great question. Um, and I, I appreciate that question because it allows me to clarify something. Um, I don't think we should be advocating for that. I think what we should be doing is saying, this is a known uh, therapy that we can use, but this is not something we should be promoting to all dairy producers. If we have a herd that has a known problem with heifer mastitis, maybe the veterinarian should get involved and say, let's start doing this because at times, depending on the drug you're using, this is gonna be off label because it has to be specified for heifers and not cows. So anytime you're treating an animal with an antibiotic, that's what should be occurring uh, is that conversation with the veterinarian. I think that, that um, those two studies clearly demonstrate lost milk production, which is the most important conclusion we can take from that, as well as say, we now need to find non-antibiotic interventions and, and 
improve our management practices to reduce those infections from establishing in the first place is really where the field I think needs to go. Okay, that makes sense. Well, thank you very much. Ben, thank you. Excellent talk. Appreciate your participation.